This is the 20th of April, and it is 2000, and we are in the conference room at the Country Music Foundation Hall of Fame, is another way of putting it, and Ronnie Millsap is here, and uh, we want to uh, talk to Ronnie about his life and uh, pursuant to the book. I'm curious about the story you almost told about your drinking. I wasn't aware you were drinking, man, so let's start with that one. Oh, well, that's, that was early on, Ralph. When, uh, yeah, it was for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, back, back in those times, it was uh, such a curiosity, you know, when you, when you get, uh, when you're in high school. And when I got out of high school, I remember making a, a trip with uh, some friends and some, uh, some cousins of mine out to Wyoming right after... I graduated from high school, and I'd never been to you know those bars and uh, out west, and uh, I was kind of it was it was fun, and you know I don't you know I I drunk beer but I'd never had a, a any uh, any whiskey or any of the hard stuff before, and I remember sitting down at the bar and the bartender said well what do you have and I was just thinking well I I don't know what to order and that song. That was popular at the time by the Kingston Trio called Scotch and Soda. Yeah. Came to mind. I said, well, I'll have a Scotch and Soda. And so I drank that, and uh, it goes, Scotch and Soda, mud and you're right, da 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 Jigger of gin. So when he, when he asked, what do you have to drink? I said, I'll have a jigger of gin, and next time a dry martini. So I kind of drank my way through that whole song <laughs> because those were at least things in a song that I'd heard of, but I actually had not had not tried. So by the time I, I got through and stood up, I guess I really was kind of blind running drunk for sure. Uh, <laughs> how old were you then? Uh, 18. So you, you were just fresh out of school, weren't yeah, you? Yes, sir. Jack Johnson was telling me, my manager, <laughs> <laughs> he said, man, there's two things that's got to happen if you're going to make it here. Ralph, Ralph Emery has to like you, number one, and Farron Young <laughs> needs to like you. <laughs> so, you know, if something happens and either one of those two things don't happen, I don't know what I can do to help you. <laughs> so that was another quote out of your book that I just fell over when you said fair and young said I don't feel sorry for you because you're blind now if you sing like Webb Pierce then I feel sorry for you he did and he's you know uh, years after that when I when, when I told him that story again I was talking to him and Hank Jr. over at the Opera House and I reminded him of that story and he said was that that insensitive and I said man that that was not insensitive now you know he struck me on the shoulder and said you son of a bitch, I don't feel sorry for you because you're blind. You know, he's got that kind of way of kind of scaring you to death, you know. I said, well, good, fan, I'm glad. You know, I, I was with Merle Kilgore yesterday, and he, he told me, he said, you know, there was one guy that, that uh, Farron wouldn't stand up to, and that was Webb. He, he said, because we had seen Webb get into too many fights and, ta and take care of himself. And he said, one night we were all playing cards, and Farron was cheating, and Webb looked across. He said, Farron, you do that again, I'm going to knock you through that wall. Uh, 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 and he said, okay, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the wildest thing. You know, when I first came here, I was playing at uh, Roger Miller's King of the Road Hotel in uh, – in 73 and, and recording during the day with uh, Jack Johnson and Tom Collins when we were trying to get a thing together for RCA. And Farron would come up there at night to, uh, to see what was going on because a lot of the industry people were, were, uh, were up there hanging out. And he'd walk in and uh, my guitar player would say, well, you know, he's got on a blue suit tonight and uh, uh, such and such tie. And so I would make those comments, you know. I'd say, Farron, hey, Farron, you, I like that blue suit you got on or that, uh, you know, that red tie or make some comment about the clothes he had on. And he was always, he was always, you know, he'd get up in the middle of the floor and just scream, Millsap's not blind. See, I told you he's not blind. He's faking. He's faking. <laughs> I saw him pay his band. He's faking. <laughs> I, uh, but I, you know, I absolutely uh, uh, loved him, and uh, the reference to, you know, Webb Pierce. So many of those people got, you know, the Webb Pierce records played such a huge role to to a person listening, growing up over in the Smoky Mountains like I did, and hearing all those Webb records. 
Uh, and then when I fi finally wound up moving right across the street from him, when I finally got here in town, he came over to the house and he said, uh, he wanted, you know, for WSM, uh, WSMV to come over and, and do that thing ever so many days where, uh, you know, he was selling things at his house, and pool, oh, yeah. wa pool water and books and records. Oh, yeah. and, and he'd come out and sing for the, you know, for the, for the folks that were coming by his house. And you bought, you bought that house from Ray Stevens. I, I sure did, yeah. And Ray, you know, you, he, he got into it with Webb over there. <laughs> Ray said he had to get out of there because those tour buses were just driving him crazy. And I said, well, they won't, they won't bother me. I don't have to see them, you know. <laughs> but I, Webb came over, and I said, you know, I, I, I don't w really want to do that thing with, uh, you know, having Channel 4 over here all the time. But, you know, it doesn't matter to me what you sell over there. I'm a big fan of yours, and whatever you do, that's fine with me. You know, uh, I got uh, Ray on the air one time, and I... And I was kidding him about that situation. And Ray said, oh, he didn't bother me. He said, I'm going to put in a shell station and sell him gas. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ray just, he was ready to move on. You know, he wanted to build another house. Well, and then during that one interview you did with Willie, Willie said that Webb told him, he said, well, Ray should have known better than move across from a star. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's right. Because <laughs> he called it, didn't he call it Hillbilly Hollywood? Over there, so, so, yeah. something like that. He did pretty well down there. Was there ever a time you could see and you said yes, and uh, and described the condition of your eye, your one of your eyes, you could see a little bit, you could ascertain color and so forth. Right. Did that finally go away? Yes, it did. Well, now that uh, was when somebody slapped it away, didn't they? That's right. What happened? That's right. It was. Um, uh, at the, in the school in, uh, in, in Raleigh that I mentioned, the academic standards were, were superb. The uh, instruction was great. The, the teachers that taught us during the daytime were the best that I think uh, that we could ever ask for. House parents w was a different thing. House parents were sometimes very um, uh, intolerant. And, uh, and like I said, it was, it was a different time. Uh, it was okay back then to, to paddle kids. It, uh, it was okay to slap somebody. Uh, although I always thought that that was very cruel to, you know, some, some friends of mine who were totally blind, you know, actually, you know, to be slapped and they didn't know it was coming. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty brutal. But uh, there was a house father that, you know, uh, that struck me and he slapped me hard enough that uh, I lost the vision in that left eye. And, uh, I was already in a school for the blind, Ralph. Uh, but I got to say, when uh, when there was all of a sudden uh, total darkness, no sensation of light, no sen you know, no none of that uh, anymore. Being able to see color or seeing somebody's face if I was close enough to them, um, even holding typing right down to my face, I could I could read my you know my homework. When all that was gone, I got to say that was a that was a hell of a new adjustment. And to, uh, and to know that that's the way it's going to be from now on, you know. That's, How uh, old were you? I was 14. It was in uh, March of 1957. And Patsy says that must have been a lonely time. It was a terrible time. And I lost uh, 20 pounds uh, in a couple of months. And do you, do you, uh, Did you lose the will to live? I lost the will to, uh, to be interested in uh, in anything uh, uh, to think that somebody would be allowed to to get away with that uh, I mean, my family uh, back in the Smokies were were poor they didn't own a, a car they didn't certainly had didn't have enough money to 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 get a lawyer to even look into that even if that were even possible back then the the, the way that those times were but it uh, it was, you know, the, it was you the know low. Today he would, the school was, would be sued. Yeah, it was the, the low would point. Be sued. It was the low point of uh, of my life. And uh, did you com did you complain about this to the to the teachers? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, did, did they, ever, they, they ever uh, look into it? They did. They actually took this up, and I I was years later uh, talked to a lady that I know over there that was uh, one of the counselors at the school, and she talked about a meeting that they had. Uh, to fire this person, and it had to be a unanimous uh, decision. 
and there was one person that because uh, this house parent was uh, a wrestling coach uh, of course all this is it's it's all moot now because uh, this person's not alive anymore mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, the, but it, at that particular meeting, they decided to, to keep him. And I was, I was just appalled that uh, something like that could happen. Uh, I went from, uh, I was 14, a pretty big boy, uh, up to for like 179 pounds. And uh, by the time it was, you know, end of the fall of the next uh, school year, I was down to 125. So oh, I'd, wow. I'd lost a, a whole lot of weight. and and uh, lost basically the, uh, the will to do anything. I was already, like I said, in a, in a school for the blind. But to have any vision mm -hmm. at all, and I still think today about even the little amount of vision that I had at that time with uh, magnifiers and all that uh, is possible with computers, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would be able to do a whole lot better, you know, uh, with, with, with that than, than I do. Uh, I, to say that you're in, in total darkness, I, I, I got to say, I guess that's true. But then eventually something else happens inside of you if, if you can ever get through the, the low part of your life uh, to where you feel like you can start to live again. What you see in your head uh, is not total darkness. It can be kind of whatever you want it to be. Uh, it, can, it can be bright. It can be... Uh, it's it's kind of like saying... Uh, you see something uh nothing is not black necessarily you don't you don't see anything out of your big toe it, it's it's just nothing it's mm -hmm. not black it's not white it's not uh, green or blue but i must say you know a lot a lot of it has to do spiritually with how you develop and uh, as someone who's totally blind i i don't feel like that that uh, i'm i'm in darkness you know the way that i was did you tell me one time that uh, some of these, some of your dorm mates, held you out the window by your feet? I'm afraid I did that to a couple. <laughs> oh, you did that? Yes, to I else. did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but we would never, uh, you know. I think uh, I think people try to do things, and maybe it's just on a Saturday, and uh, you've been uh, in, in this school too long, and you've been cooped up, and you're bored, or or something. And there's this one particular. Uh, guy that was with he's two or three young years younger than I was but, uh, it was one of those days where it seemed like I just got in trouble every way I, I turned you know we were I'd held him outside the window and uh, you know we had uh, the sheets all uh, tied together as for ropes and uh, but we didn't hurt him you know oh well good yeah and and <laughs> we've been whittling some uh, some you know, pieces of wood for spears, you know, and I sailed mine into Jerry Lewis's back, you know, uh, out there, not meaning to, uh, and playing a lot of, a lot of blind people is really weird because we used to play that thing stretch, you know, with a knife where you, you know, you stretch your feet as far, I don't know, you, you know if you've seen that game, but you stretch fingers your, your yeah, your fingers and your feet and you stretch that. That's pretty, that's pretty wild for blind people to be doing that, but there again, it was. Tell me how you play that game. Yeah, you just, you. Uh, oh, are you talking about putting your uh, your fingers down, and you take a knife and try to hit between the fingers? Yeah, you do that, and you also do it with the feet, where you throw it into the dirt, you know, and uh, uh, people do to see how well, far. Well, that's really being bored, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got I got to tell you, I was there for 13 years, Ralph. <laughs> Since we got the tape rolling, I want you to tell me about driving the car at uh, Fort Bragg, I guess. Yeah. You well, actually drove an automobile. Yeah, I... I, I, a, I passed a guard. I did. Um, in the 66, I had started, I had met uh, this guy actually in 64, a promoter at Fort Bragg, and I wound up doing a whole lot of work up, up there. Uh, he had sometimes you know as as many days in a row as i could do we do the nco clubs uh and we'd move the next day and play a, an evening show over to 82nd airborne and we'd move to an e4 or we'd do some two or three service clubs during the day and then we'd go set up somewhere else at night we'd play uh 
several different locations just in one day. I had a four-piece band that was traveling around with me and a, a guitar player was from Canton, North Carolina. Uh, a guy that I was really, really fond of at the time and uh, we'd worked up this little method uh, after some 55 days straight up there at Fort Bragg. Uh, We've been talking about this little method of where he could sit behind me and uh, if I was in the driver's seat, he could, he could put his hands on both my shoulders and he could squeeze my right shoulder, you know, if I, wanted to, if I needed to turn right. He'd squeeze my left shoulder if I needed to turn left. And he'd squeeze both my shoulders when he needed to put on the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounded like, you know, fun to me. And, I, you know, it's, uh, I'd always love to... At the, at the fairs to ride the bumper cars. That's a that's a fun thing because the whole purpose of that is just to run over everything and run into folks. And the, but uh, we had this little thing. So after 55 days straight, we decided that this was going to be the night that I was going to drive the van. So I got in the driver's seat and I knew knew all about how to start it up because I'd been doing that, been sitting up there, tinkering around with doing this for quite some time. So I pulled out of the uh, NCO club where we're playing and uh, moving on uh, along the road and turning right as he squeezed my shoulder and turning left as he squeezed my shoulder and working my way eventually out onto the main thoroughfare which is Bragg Boulevard in Fayetteville where uh, Fort Bragg is and going along and, and he squeezed both my shoulders and I stomped the brakes and I hit him too hard, and as a sit-in drummer we had that night, it threw him all the way from the very back, all the way across up to the windshield, and he decided he he didn't want to ride with me anymore, so he, he got out, and we kept going, and um, eventually found out as we're going on that the, that the MPs were pulling, doing checks, they were uh, checking vehicles, so uh, we had to get in line, and Stan, my guitar player, Stan Lurice, was his name and we kept moving forward and inching up until it was our turn and uh, he said you know, the MP said get out of the car and give me need to see your registra registration your driver's license and uh, I got out and put my hands on the roof and, and I said I don't have my registration I don't have my driver's license and I said we've been playing over here at this job and nobody knew who I was at that time uh, you know this uh, uh, he said, you mean you're out here without your driver's license? And I said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm afraid I am. And he said, <clears throat> he said well, I'll tell you what, I'm going let to you, let you go this time, but don't you ever be out here again without your driver's <laughs> license. I, I said, all right, sir. So I got back in and, uh, and drove off. And he was never aware. He never knew that, uh, that it was just a, a crazy blind guy. Have you closed your place down in uh, Myrtle Beach? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I, How long were you down there? I was there from for two years, from uh, uh, fall of uh, 95 through uh, basically like summer of 97. We, we started working back out on the road in the fall of 97. So, so I, I was there for two years. So you're working out of here? Yes, sir. It was a, it was a hard choice to, to make and... Uh, how many, how many shows were you doing a day? Oh, goodness, we were doing basically like eight shows a week. Um, they get on your nerves. It did me. It uh, uh, it looks good. Uh, well, see, I know it looks good on paper. I've had this conversation with Ray Stevens about Branson, and he finally gave it up because it wore. He said it wore him out. It looks great on paper, and uh, the determining factor f for me, uh, uh, this company built a beautiful theater and I didn't I didn't have any any money in that venture and I, I'm 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 glad that I didn't I, I just you know it was something a, a big decision to to make the, you know to go down there and live down in Myrtle Beach for a long period of time because uh, if you're playing all those shows a week you just got to move there almost you know we didn't move out of our house here but I mean we were gone from here uh, probably, you know, eight or nine months of the year. Don't you become a prisoner of the business on that basis? I, you know, there, there were a whole lot of things on, on the shows in that theater that I'm really proud of because there's things that I never probably would have gotten to do 
and things on a, on a traveling production show that I, I probably couldn't do as far as setting that, that up from night to night because it, it was, uh, you know, it was, the show was set there in one place. There were some really great things that happened. But it's, it's economics, and, you know, this, this company, uh, they weren't able to, there was the, the, uh, the aquarium, there was uh, the, the, the hotels and the, and the restaurants and the things that were supposed to go along with this whole package never materialized the way that they hoped that they would. Uh, so, you know, contractually, uh, uh, I was basically through with what I was supposed to do, but more than that, it just, it just got to where it didn't, it didn't work anymore for me. And I got to uh, almost to the point of, uh, I mean, I could go down there and do the shows, but uh, some of those matinee shows, I got to tell you, you know, you, you, you figure you got into this business because you just love the music. And you had to kind of poke yourself and remind yourself of that sometimes on those matinee shows because they were kind of hard to get through. Oh, I love those, those syndicated radio shows. And, Ralph, you, uh, my goodness, you were on a whole bunch of radio stations. I, I still have those shows. Oh, do you? Yes, sir. I surely do. I'm, uh, as you know, big archiving nut as far as, you know, having a whole lot of records and tapes and uh, radio performances and things. But uh, making... making well, you, you used to bring your toys. Yes, yes. I did, and, and, and I probably, I brought the most archaic of all, the Braille devices, which is a, called a slate and pointer. And it's, uh, it's, it's a stylus and a, and a slate, and you actually have to punch each Braille dot in one at a time. So it's, a, it's certainly a long way from being high tech. But I was taking notes with uh, this slate and uh, pointer, this slate and stylus, and uh, you have to punch and uh, why were you taking notes I, I forgot I, well you know usually during the during the show if if something's coming up or if uh, if you say Ronnie as soon as Mac finishes this I want you to, to tell such such and such okay. and so I'd make myself a note that's coming up and that that way I would look at it and I'd have a chance to think about it just a few minutes before it actually uh, was going to happen but you made reference early on in, in the show that it, you can hear those little dots every time you punch them and you said what are you doing over there and I said I'm I'm, I'm writing I'm writing and taking notes over here and he said well it sounds like a chicken pecking around over there and I said oh okay and and that went on and he, Ralph does f uh, five five days of, of his shows in, in as your there in, in basically one sitting, and uh, we do all the, the talk, and then they put the shows together with the music. Uh, somewhere during the, the process of all that, it was, we were into the fifth day, and I put everything away back in my briefcase, and I figured, well, we're getting almost uh, ready to, to be through. And uh, Ralph says, um, can we get the microphone down here a little close to the table? said, I want to hear some more of that, how you write Braille. And I'd already had everything put away, and uh, I made the remark, oh, God, Ralph, I, let me get my pecker out, because, because I'd already put my slate and pointer away, so let me get my pecker out. And, uh, and it really came, it went back to, because he was talking about uh, chicken pecking around is what it sounded and like. Mac so, Wiseman, yeah. And Mac Wiseman. Yeah, and Mac Wiseman, you know, he tipped over, and uh, he's, he's a big guy anyway, God bless him, and he... It's incredible, you know, how how how, how uh, the way those the way those things happen. It's just basically because I'd I'd uh, been thinking about what Ralph had said probably a couple hours earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and that King of the Road gig was was important when I was first in town because well, it. You know, a lot of people would would be afraid to come here and get a regular job because they you know people just get so used to you that they don't care. But you came. And turned it into a total plus because all the artists started coming out to hear it. It was just a really good thing, and I and I would work on the the songs. Uh, I, I played five nights a week, which that was good instead of six, and I'd work with during the day down there with with Tom and the writers, uh, and with Jack Johnson, and and then we would work up the songs. And when I'd have a you know that that uh, one of those days off, we'd we'd have usually a Monday off, and we'd book the sessions and. Uh, so I was doing this little, this little thing, which 
it's good to keep a singer singing. There's nothing like uh, uh, it's the best thing a singer can do is to is to keep yourself loose by actually singing as much as you can without overdoing it. But I mean, that's why a lot of times people on a tour, one time they get into the groove the third or fourth day, man, they get to really singing real well because they're doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. well, that's what helped me early on here because I was I was working. And Did uh, Charlie Rich follow you or precede you at, he, the, at the King of the Road? He probably, uh, he probably, I'm not sure, Ralph. I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Well, I, was it at the King of the Road that he fell into the drum and you yeah, thought he was dead? Yeah, that was the night that he came up and said, here's going to let a poor boy sit in and play piano. So I let him sit, sit in, and uh, he played behind closed doors, but then he wanted to stand up and sing The Most Beautiful Girl. <laughs> and uh, and he fell in the middle of the song, and uh, and uh, he fell, and his head fell into the kick drum, and... <laughs> and uh, you know, he was out. He was just totally passed out. We had to roll him off stage. We stopped between songs, my bass player, and I rolled him off the stage and sat him in a chair, you know, <laughs> over there near the stage. And he was still there when we left that night. <laughs> God bless him. Do you bowl? I, I used to do that, Ralph. Uh, uh, it's been a while. And it's a two-part question. If so... How do you do? <laughs> Most blind bowlers, there's a there's a, a rail that you set up uh, behind the foul line, and it it kind of gives you that uh, a four step approach, uh, and by the speed of your step or the speed of the of the the ball, uh, that that the movement of your of your arm by doing either. Speeding up your step will make the, the ball go more left. Uh, you know, but also, keeping your step constant and speeding the delivery of the ball will make it go more left. But it's been, it's been years since I, you know, did that. And uh, well, I mean, something, something I used to love to, love to do. And in fact, in, 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 in high school, I was probably uh, at 161. I, I, I was at my average. And it's, it's uh, for a blind bowler, it's, it's, Pretty high. Can you bowl in a regular bowling alley? Oh yeah, yeah, yes sir. You sure can. All all you need is that uh, to have your rail. You set that up behind. Uh, it, it sits uh, on the alley, right behind the foul line, and uh, it's good to have your own, uh, you know, your own bowling balls, your own uh, shoes, and your own paraphernalia, all that stuff that's familiar to you. But absolutely. Used to love to go bowl around here and uh, love the hot dogs. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Twisting the dial over at, uh, when I was in Raleigh, over at the school in, in Raleigh, and found you on WSM. And like so many of us, we, when we tuned in at night, we, we felt that you were connected to country music so well that you knew all the the ins and outs and things that most people, even here in town, didn't know. You had the inside track. We felt like also that you were a friend, somebody that we that we trusted. And, and uh, even though I, you know, I didn't get a chance to meet you till I got to Nashville, I feel like I, you know, I, you're somebody I already knew. Thank you.